that's eight thousand on the senior. Thank you, Jessica. That's what I was gonna forget. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Elias Elgado, and I'm a senior program analyst here at United Way of Greater Houston. So again, uh, thank thank you all for joining us today on this chilly morning for uh for our, I believe fourth talking quantity of the year. Um, as I was mentioned earlier, today is going to be a little bit different than previous coffee quantities. Um, it's a new project that we you know embarked today with the, with a few partners who are really excited to to showcase this new project with you all and and have um, them talk about their experiences that we've all kind of had over the last couple of months. So with that, um, usually Jessica, if you can please go to the next slide, you know, go over our coffee and quality ground rules. Number one being, this is a safe space to share and learn, and you know, also have an open heart and open mind. You know, it's like, what, what have you learned from coffee and quality? What, what's something new that you learned and what's something that you can take back to your, to your work? And then number three is, you know, participate by sharing. So if you are comfortable, um, share, turn your camera on today. We highly encourage that you do. We love to see beautiful faces and bright smiles early in the morning. And again, you know, this is a safe space. So it's by invitation. So, you know, you have no obligation to speak. So, if, you know, we call on you for whatever reason and you don't feel comfortable participating. You can just you know, put in the chat that you say pass and we can um, redirect that to somebody else. Next slide, please, Jessica. Again, and also, you know, making a plug to our to our team's channel. So if you are new to Coffee and Quality, you know, please feel free to drop your email in the chat and we can make sure to add you to our Coffee and Quality channel where we share a lot of information and also upcoming events that are related to Coffee and Quality. So if you're new and you, you would like to join the team channel, please drop your email in the chat and we'll make sure to add you into the team's channel. And with that, um, I'm really excited today to introduce our very first coffee and quantity case study. You may be asking yourself, well, what is the case study? So the coffee and quantity case study is an opportunity for nonprofit organizations that have established data practices and evaluation practices to answer research question related, um, a re research related question with the support of United Way of Houston and the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. And today, for our very first coffee and quality case study, we partnered with Angel Reach, who is a United Way funded partner from Montgomery County. And before we do get started, I do want to give a big thank you to Corinne from, um, from Angel Reach and Dan Catherine Lee for embarking with us on this new journey for the last couple of months. It's been a real, real insightful experience from my perspective. And I'm sure that I would hope they feel the same that it's something new that, that we embarked with and we're really. You know, excited to share some of the findings from this very first case study with you all today. And with that, um, the next I just we want to provide a little bit more context of what the case study is and what what we learned from it. So this, like I mentioned before, you know, uh, we partnered with Angel Reach for this very first case study. Um, they're, they're an organization in Montgomery County that serves youths between the ages of sixteen and twenty-four through their um living transitional living program, kinship program, and community outreach program. And we started with Angel Reach because they have strong data practices existing. So we felt that, you know, to better elevate their current um, workflow, it, it was a perfect opportunity for them to, for, them, for us to support them as they want to establish better data practices and enhance what they currently have existing. You know, over the, fa over the past five months, um, we have, Angel Reach has been working with United Way and the Kinder Institute to answer a few research questions related to their data practices and data collection practices. You know, the Kinder Institute did a deep uh, dive analysis on some of their existing data practices, and they provided some recommendations on what they believe that some of the trends they saw in the data that could help support their existing work to make sure that they are capturing new data and enhance those current practices. And as we go to the presentation, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat. We are going to have a Q&A session after the, after the presentation, so we are going to hold off on those questions to the very end. But if a question pops up into your head, please feel free to type it in the chat, and we will come back to it during that Q&A session. And with that, I will turn it over to Corinne from Angel Reach and Dan Lee and Catherine from the Kinder Institute to share about to talk about their insights and experiences in our very first case study. And with that, Corinne, I am handing the baton over to you. Thank 
I have control now, Jessica. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Corinne. I am with Angel Reach. As Elia said, we are an organization that works with kinship families and youth who have aged out of the foster system and or at high risk for homelessness, aged 16 to 24. The youth who come to us are so lost and alone, desperately seeking guidance as they transition to adult living. And it's not moving. There we go. They arrive as homeless. They have no money and no source of income. Many have not graduated from high school or have their GED. Most have never had anyone teach them how to drive. Most have not received routine medical care like checkups and dental visits. All have lived with significant trauma and many self-medicate to deal with their trauma. They come to us with no plan and Angel Reach coaches them on their journey to develop a plan for success. The clients, with the help from their social worker, who we call youth coaches, develop their individual development plans. We call it an IDP of what are their goals to accomplish. They then begin their journey at Angel Reach. So we gave some examples here. You can see here that Jimmy has a goal of working on achieving his GED. Susie has a goal of getting a job. Jacob wants to go to vocational school, and Alice, she just wants to get her lifestyle drug-free. They work on learning how to get a job and maintaining employment, achieving adequate education, learning life skills, such as how to do laundry and learning how to cook. They work on their emotional well-being through counseling. They learn how to drive a car and get their IDs, and they're coached to a stable financial well-being on subjects such as managing their finances and learning how to save. All important things to know and do so that they can be self-sufficient. In 2019, Angel Reach took part in a strategic plan where we defined what we call the seven indicators for success for successful sufficient self-sufficient living. Their goals that Angel Reach believes as a youth achieves, they'll be prepared then to live a successful adult life. Goals like obtaining their high school diploma or GED, achieving a job with a steady income, having a safe place to live, being emotional stable and living a drug-free life, having access to transportation, and having a support system outside Angel Reach. Angel Reach developed a self-sufficiency matrix which tracks a client's success in 12 areas that we believe supported our indicators for success and provided a tracking mechanism for how they were doing. A snapshot as it may. You can see the 12 subjects here. And each of these areas had a score range from one to five with one being the lowest and five being the highest. Each quarter, a client was evaluated on where they were in each of these areas and a scoring was taken place. For example, on the finances matrix category, which is on the left, the client would be scored a one if they were not employed or a five if they were making enough money to live on their own and save two. Or on the substance abuse category, which is on the right, a client would be scored a two if they showed continued self-medicating when they were struggling, but scored a five if they had been clean for over six months. And then at the end of the year, we looked at the matrix scores as an evaluation of the success of the program. But this just didn't tell a true enough story on the success of each individual. Take the stories here. Jimmy, who we talked about in the beginning, was with Angel Reach for only two quarters, then left to live back with family. So what story did his score tell? And Susie, she had some struggles in a couple of matrix subjects, and her scores dipped a bit when she quit a job and was unemployed for a while, until she found a new job. Jacob, well, he's moving along, but he's on his third job. And Alice, she struggled with her self-medicating, had to leave the program and then came back, so her scoring is not complete for showing success. So looking at the scores over a year's time, out of 62 clients, 18 clients had scores improved, 10 clients had scores lowered, 
34 clients did not have successive scores recorded or they stayed the same and only one quarter, may even had only one quarter even gaps between their scores. And three clients graduated from the program. But does this measure success? We know that the clients had their own successes throughout their own client journey, but the scores did not show the complete picture. Scores which stood steady with no change did not necessarily reflect a bad thing. And this is what we struggled with is how we manage a client's success. So we asked Kinder Institute to look at our scoring and give us some insight. And now I turn it over to them. Awesome, thank you so much, Corinne, for that tee up there. Uh, okay, give me one second while we hand over uh, control of the presentation. Um, all right, so uh, this was a fantastic opportunity for us to in some ways do a proof of concept that what we were interested in was whether or not uh, we would be able uh, to uh, connect with the nonprofit, be able to hear what they were needing and be able to work with them in real time to both understand their data, provide recommendations around it. And again, you know, sort of to Corinne's point, help make sure that they're getting that information that they were after at the end of the day. And so we came into this uh, collaboration with Angel Reach through our partnership with United Way. Um, and, you know, for our presentation today, sort of want to break down for you sort of four general uh, uh, buckets of information. First, we're going to start out with what our goals were for this, uh, uh, this collaboration, and again, working through this partnership that Kinder has with United Way. Uh, next, we're going to get into the process that we use, and I think the reason we want to spend a little bit of time there is, uh, you know, as researchers, we oftentimes want to hop into the data and the findings, uh, but our process, in fact, I think was, um, as we'll get to later on, is, is one of the ways that uh, one of the things that I think really allowed for this collaboration to be so successful. Uh, after we talk about our process, we're going to hop into the results of what we actually found. So we will talk through uh, some of the data uh, and findings. And then finally, we'll finish by sort of pulling back in some of our discussion of process, some of our discussion of the results to point out what we were observing. And based off of those observations, what we were making in terms of recommendations for Angel Reach. So in terms of our goals, uh, we wanted to come into this conversation, we came into this conversation wanting to support Angel Reach's program development. Uh, that uh, from our perspective, uh, this is an opportunity uh, for us to leverage our uh, research skills and our research and data knowledge uh, to help support experts in the field in terms of Angel Reach and the programs and the services that they um, are providing and the youth that they are serving. Uh, we wanted to come in with the idea of recommendations um, and wanting to think about those recommendations both in a way that would speak very much directly uh, to Angel Reach and to their data and their information, while also recognizing that there is a broader conversation that we're trying to start here, uh, which is to say bringing those uh, recommendations in such a way that they can inform uh, uh, the larger landscape of nonprofit data consumption and production. And so those were the goals that we walked into this. And so uh, with those goals in mind, I want to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Catherine Perez, to talk with us about our process and some of our findings. Uh, thank you, Dan. So we thought we would start off by talking about this with the process and what it looked like and how it was with working in that research practice partnership model. So part of this case study was to create a spot for Kinder, United Way, and Angel Reach to improve data consumption and production. This was a highly collaborative process that utilized the um, the partnership model and required relationship building to improve the data to meet the organization's needs. We met with Angel Reach and United Way back in early June at Angel Reach's organization to discuss what they wanted to understand and answer based on the data they had. We learned about their program, who they were, the amazing work that they're doing in the community and got the opportunity to learn from them as well as understand their goals for the program and what they were interested in learning. From here, we co-created research questions based on those interests, but this was an iterative process that required us to all regularly communicate and engage with each other as questions did arise throughout the process. These questions could have been um, anything from the program, the data, the data collection process, or um, 
um, other reasons. <clears throat> Next, we gained access to the data, which itself is its own process, but once we did receive that access, we started the data cleaning. However, after reviewing the data, we realized that we would have to revise some of our research questions based on the data that were available. We regularly met every few weeks or so, so to ask any additional questions, as well as present some of the findings throughout the process. As a result, through this collaboration, we were able to answer a series of research questions and make several recommendations for AngelReach. All right. Yes. Okay. I'm jumping in here. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Lee Williams. I'm a research analyst at Kinder. Um, and so through that uh, collaborative process um, that Catherine just highlighted, um, we came upon some research questions, um, both to uh, begin this project and then also sort of as we moved along and, and better understood things based on what the data uh, were showing. And so at this first stage that I'll be talking about, we were really, really interested in sort of better understanding clients as they entered um, the Angel Reach program. And so we're, let's see, let me make sure this, okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, we were curious about the typical value, the quote unquote typical values of each matrix item, um, looking across all of the clients for whom we had data at the first uh, evaluation. Second, we were interested in seeing if um, did clients sort of like fall into different categories or specific profiles that we could better understand them around. Um, and then we were curious if membership in those profiles, were they to come out, um, if they predicted program retention, um, which for current purposes, we just defined as having data at a time two, so having data for a second evaluation. The analyses that we used to try to answer these questions, the first was just computing the average score for each of the matrix items, um, and then also looking at the median value for these scores, um, which is just the center point of the distribution. Um, second, we, we ran a, an analysis called a latent profile analysis, and that's getting at the, the second two research questions there, which uses an algorithm to evaluate, uh, it's a person-centered analysis, um, and it uses an algorithm to evaluate similarities or patterns of scores um, across individual clients um, to see if they fall into specific profiles or categories. And then each client is assigned to one of those profiles based on how similar they are to the sort of constellation of values um, that represent the different categories. Um, and then there were several model fit indices that we would run, um, and we used interpretability of the different model specifications um, to sort of land upon um, one model in particular. And then using those profiles that we established, uh, we then ran a logit regression, um, which for these current purposes determines the probability that um, on average individuals in one, in one profile had compared to the other profile um, of being retained. And again, retention here um, just means they had data for a second time point. So to jump into some analyses here, or some results here, um, this, this plot uh, along the horizontal axis is just the average matrix item score across all of the clients for whom we had time one data. Uh, and then on the vertical axis over there on the left, you can see the different matrix items. And so as you can see, there is fairly wide variability in the average scores that clients are coming into the program with, um, with child care up there at the top around five and then employment um, somewhat lower. Um, however, there are some issues with looking at just average values, especially for categorical data. In this case, the five different values that individuals could have um, for each matrix item because as you can see on the right, there were these anchoring descriptions of those values. And so if you get a, um, an average value of 4.2 for childcare, for example, uh, the question is raised, like, should we interpret this as a four? Should we interpret this as a five? Like, what does that exactly mean? Um, and so a way of dealing with that is running the median and figuring out sort of the center point of the distribution, which gives us a, a whole number and allows us to anchor those values in the descriptions that the youth coaches used um, to evaluate their clients. So you can see here, again, I have the matrix items all, all the way over to the left, the median uh, in the middle, uh, and the anchor on the far right side. That's a bunch of text, but we can hone in on um, just a couple items here. 
And this sort of allows us to think about, you know, the quote unquote typical client coming in uh, is coming in without a job and without income. Whereas if you look down at substance abuse, um, typically folks are coming in without um, having an abuse uh, issue with different substances. Now, shifting into the profile results, um, we found that through that algorithmic process that I described a little bit earlier, um, we were able to identify two separate profiles. Um, again, which clients could be sort of organized into based upon their specific values. Um, and that provided the best fit to the data uh, that we were looking at. So for the first profile, um, 29 clients were sorted into that one. And for profile two, 81 clients. So the majority of folks landed in this second profile. Uh, and this is meaningful uh, because we were able to look at differences across the two profiles and see that profile two clients, again, the majority, had lower values than profile one clients on several matrix items, which I'm going to visualize for you now. Uh, so you can see, again, on the horizontal axis, this is score. Um, on the vertical axis, it's matrix items. And the profiles are denoted by colors. So the lighter blue is profile one. Again, the smaller category, and then profile two is the darker blue. And so just for this for this plot, the center point that you can see, the circle or the triangle, those represent average values across the two profiles. And then the bars represent confidence intervals, um, which is just sort of the range of values that we can be reasonably sure that the true average falls within. And I'll point your attention to the matrix item averages that do not have overlapping confidence intervals. Um, and this represents statistical significance, meaning we can be pretty sure that the differences are not due to chance um, and sort of error in the data, um, but are actually true differences. Uh, and this is meaningful because it can help AngelReach use limited resources um, and sort of direct their attention to particular matrix items, again, for the majority of folks who are coming in uh, at profile two. Finally, um, looking at how these profiles relate to program retention and having time to data, um, we can see, so for the 29 clients in profile one, about 80% of them uh, showed up for, were, were able to show up for a second evaluation. Whereas those in profile two, the 81 clients, um, only about half uh, have a second time point of data. And one of the models that we ran, we found that the odds for profile one clients having that time two data are about three and a half times those for profile two. And again, the implications of just better understanding um, the, the makeup of clients entering into the program um, can be used to better direct resources and sort of figure out the highest leverage points uh, to support the, the most youth. Um, and so now I'm gonna kick it back over to Catherine uh, to talk about some additional analyses that we ran. Thank you, Lee. Um, so first, I'd like to note that the analysis that Lee did were interested in two time points, regardless of whether or not they were consecutive. So in this case, we were interested in how time in the program had an effect on scores quarterly, which means we wanted to look at consecutive time points. These changed scores would identify if youth went up if they went down or if they did not change between time one and time two. And so based on the available data, we were able to use two time points. We asked two research questions to assess these change scores and whether or not they indicate if youth are stable or continuing to stay with the need for improvement. So the first question was based on the 12 uh, individual matrix scores over time, which individuals are slipping and where does the program need to give extra attention to between time one and time two? And then are clients who do not have a change in score between time one and time two stable or are they continuing to stay at the score that they are at? So, having trouble switching over. Um, one second. I am not able to move the slide. No. Okay, thank you. Um, so the table two presents a summary of the proportion of youth who had a drop in score, an increase in score, or saw no change in score between time one and time two. So for that first um, column with the percentages, those represent the drop in score. 
I am, I'm sorry, I'm still, there we go. Okay. So this one, I just wanted to highlight one on there for the mental health. So this was the largest proportion of um, clients who had a drop in their score. So again, this is only indicating within the first two time points. However, I'd like to really pay attention to that second time point, or I'm sorry, the second column, which is the no change in score. So as you can see here, a large proportion with the exception of the transportation and mobility saw no change in their score. So what does that mean? So in this case, let's look at finances. 62% saw no change in score, meaning from the first time point that they came into the program, and then the second time point, the score stayed the same. And then a same thing with substance abuse, almost three quarters saw no change in their score. Although some did go up and some went down, who are these individuals that saw no change in their score? And what does that um, lack of change mean? So there are two ways to actually look at this. So these are the individuals who are stable or they're continuing to stay at the score that they're at. And so in this case, no change can actually be a good thing. So the table three shows the breakdown by the score itself of the, on the matrix uh, for each or for these two items. So these are the individuals that reported a one, a two, a three, a four, and a five that did not change between time points. So for finances, as you can see here, that a majority of the um, the people who are these clients who are reporting finances, most of them are reporting consistent time points of either a one and two, indicating that they may be more likely to be continuing to stay with need for improvement. However, you see the opposite happening with substance abuse. So there are a few that did not report a five, but generally speaking, this item represents more so stability compared to others. So based on the results from the analyses and our experience through this process, we identified a series of observations and recommendations for angel reach. So the first observation was the 12 item matrix and how it's intended to be fielded every quarter to show how youth may have changed over time. Um, however, when further examining the time between administration, it revealed that there were significant differences between assessments. So these differences could have been as low as 15 days in between the first and a second assessment to as far as 423 days. Now, reasons for this could vary, including people leaving the program, but this was um, an observation that was made. So it's recommended that Angel Reach employ an automated 90-day reminder system to assist youth coaches to standardize the data collection efforts over a period of time. So this would allow for consecutive measures to be taken at the 90 days for each of the youth to allow for um, different comparisons and to understand their scores individually as well. Next, merging data across demographic, housing, matrix, and goal setting files led to missingness and variables because not all youth showed up in each file. So what this means is once the data were merged together, some youth were potentially using services that, not, that other youth were not. But when the data came together, it looked as if other data had missing variables when really they just were not using those resources. So it was recommended that Angel Reach create designations for each, each youth to signal which youth have missing data and which youth should not have data to discern which services they are using. And this could also be tied back to establishing automated reminders for youth coaches to know which data need to be collected from certain clients. So for the third observation, data assessing client goals contain both standardized and unstandardized ways of writing goals, making it challenging to aggregate and monitor success over time. So this, these data were included in a, in a spreadsheet in a single cell. And so analyzing these data or understanding these goals were very, they varied between clients. And so it was recommended that AngelReach develop a protocol for capturing and monitoring youth goals articulated, articulated by the youth themselves then converted to the seven indicators of success. And then along with this, it would require establishing a start and end date for uh, by the youth coaches to allow for follow-up. So in a way, this kind of holds the youth accountable to themselves, as well as building that conversation and engagement with the youth coaches. So using this form, uh, the standard classification system would improve the ability of the data to inform key stakeholders on the organization's success because this would be data with evidence that supports the outcomes and that the program is doing what it needs to do or what it intends to do.
I'm sorry, it's frozen. Um, there we go. Okay. And so finally, um, the for the fourth observation, matrix item values were not clearly vertically scaled or flowed sequ sequentially, and it was sometimes unclear which values uh, were indicative of success. So it was suggested that AngelReach revisit the 12 item matrix to determine if data collected are aligned with the, the evaluation and information needed for the organization and if the measure captures success based on the program. Additionally, having the matrix items be vertically scaled would encourage measures intended to change over time, show how the youth are progressing through the program. And developing these vertically scaled item measures would mean having one level mean something different from another and having each level uh, show improvements or growth. This could improve stability in the measurement over time, regardless of the youth coach who conducts the assessment and determine if youth are succeeding or slipping during the program. Thank you. And that's going to be it for us over here. So I believe this is Eugene. Okay, I got it back. So um, so then I went back to Angel Reach. And in discussions with United Way and Kinder Institute and looking at the data and looking at different things collected, um, it was interesting because we had like a mind meld that we both were thinking the same things as um, of recommendations for improvement of our program and our measuring. And we came up with this brilliant idea, which was so simple, and that was for measuring client success by the completion of their goals. All clients define their goals when they enter into angel reach. They have personal client-driven goals, like they want to get a high school diploma or they want to get their own driver's license. They want to feel healthy or clear their record. It goes like that. We have listed here some of the goals that clients actually have spoken and is applied in their um, man case management. Tracking the success of the use through the program is now measuring the completion of the client's goals as they move through the program. For example, if a client has four goals and when leaving the program has completed all of their four goals, well then 100% success is achieved. The measurement of success in the program, we pivoted it from a strategic plan of mission goals of the matrix to one of client-driven goals and measurement of their own personal success. And it's frozen. There we go. Another pivotal point of success was the implementation of Casebook for client case management. When we began this uh, case study, we were in the process of changing over all of our case management to casebook. So we were like in this transition anyway. But um, in initiating this case management system, the tracking of success for the client included, um, per recommendations of Kinder, honestly, was standardizing the client profiles for all measurement tools used, such as the rosters and the goal achievement. All of their profiles were standardized. We weren't using different systems. It gave us the ability to automate workflow reminders so that staff did not rely on their own notes for when to do an assessment, but receive an automatic reminder to help them. As the um, Kinder slide indicated, there was like one that was like 15 days up to 423. Well, we were originally basing it on calendar. It was like such an aha moment um, when actually it would be 90 days between each score taken and not based just on first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. So that the ability to automate that kept it more regulated. And then to provide it access to goal tracking electronically for calculating the success of each individual. We implemented that in through Casebook. We're in the process of doing that actually. And the um, where Casebook would calculate their scores uh, and goal entry and completion. With the help of United Way and Kinder Institute, Angel Reach was able to implement a new method for tracking client success in the program. It gives the client tools for showing success to themselves. It's really important that we could show the clients that they were succeeding and providing data to back up our client success in the program. And so at this point, that ends it. 
We just want to thank United Way and Kinder Institute for this opportunity. We appreciate their patience as they were challenged working with our nonprofit data. We don't have all of the technology uh, access points that they would have wished. <laughs> we were in the midst of changing over data collection technology to Cape's book when this began that added an extra dimension to it. And what an opportunity this was and something we are so grateful to have taken a part in. And for all of you out there in the nonprofit land, we wanna challenge you. What impact are you making on your community for the long term? Look at the data you have and think about what story it is telling you. How are you guiding the people you serve to a better place versus measuring how many services provided or meals served? And then after you determine your story, we'll go out and tell everyone about it. And there we are. Well, thank you so much, Corinne and the team from Kinder Institute. Before we jump into the Q&A, there's so many great questions in the chat. Let's give them all a round of applause. This was yeah. definitely from June until probably up till Tuesday when we were working on this together. So huge thank you as well as thank you to Elias Delgado for his con contributions as well. Um, really excited to kind of unpack this and talk a little bit about this. This is a, definitely a, a different kind of experience where you have a nonprofit working with United Way and Kinder Institute and in kind of this technical assistance format. And I think part of the case study, the, the grounding of it was that we wanted to be able to use the tools that Corinne had at Angel Reese. What were they already using? And then what could we build upon from um, what's available at Kinder Institute and their kind of analytic powerhouse that they have there. So I'm going to start at the top with some questions because I think the data cleaning process question really was like the a bulk of the time at the beginning to really kind of um, make, make some headway into everything around that. So Dan, can you talk a little bit more about that data cleaning process and kind of what was coming up for, for y'all as y'all were getting um, getting into that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so let me start with a thank you to Angel Reach for this opportunity to be working with them that, um, you know, as as Catherine mentioned, we utilize a partnership model and that partnership model relies coming together with a particular spirit. Um, and that might sound a little kumbaya, but I think it is an important spirit to bring to the table because um, from the day one, there was a receptivity. There was there was a willingness to hear and talk through the good, the bad, the ugly in a very transparent and honest way, which allowed for our dialogue to be one of collaboration, coordination, and not defensiveness and reaction. And like, ooh, how do I subtly hint that this thing? And there was just a very good willingness. And 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 I think it started with the idea that. We knew from the beginning that Angel Reach is out there doing good. There wasn't a question about that. It was, is there a way of looking at their data that might be able to, to help perhaps contribute to doing better, right? And and I, I hopefully the reverse kind of, Kinder is not in here to judge us and give us a grade. It's Kinder is here at the table wanting to, in, in many ways, leverage sort of what, what we love and what we do uh, uh, to, 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 again, you know, sort of inform people and, and the community. And so um, just want to acknowledge that piece. You know, I think um, uh, in, in many ways, it was that relationship, it was that partnership model, that shared spirit that allowed for this data cleaning process to run um, very smoothly, while also um, not as planned, that uh, we, um, in originally talking with Angel Reach and beginning to understand some of the data that they had, um, it took a moment for us to uh, be able to access those data. Part of that is a Rice um, Institutional Review Board thing, and, and that's a story for another day and another time. Um, but um, what happened was that we, through conversation, developed a set of questions that we thought we might be able to answer based on dialogue about the data. And when the data showed up, and we started to try to merge it together. We started to look at it longitudinally, which is just to say, look and follow the same kids over time. What we very quickly started to learn was that the data were not necessarily what we had been envisioning in our mind. And so part of what we needed to do within the cleaning space was going back to Angel Reach, talking to them about what we were seeing, in part to check and make sure that we hadn't done something funky in our data processing um, uh, with their stuff, right? So went back to them, talked to them about what we were seeing, 
And in that confirmation about, yes, that's, you know, these are the data, this is some of the stuff that we're seeing as well on our end, uh, begin to sort of shift and pivot some of the questions that we might be able to answer through these analyses um, with the data that were had. And so, uh, you know, part of it was, again, that linking across multiple data files, going through and pulling out duplicate cases, um, uh, going back to Angel Reach and asking for clarification around different values. Um, and, and so there was an iterative cleaning process that at the end of the day, um, you know, there, there was no fancy uh, magic being performed on, on, on our end at all with it, but rather, I, I think, again, it was that collaborative space that allowed for us to find some um, differences in the data that than what we had anticipated seeing, uh, clean them, understand them, bring them to Angel Reach, talk with them about what we were seeing, and then develop a shared game plan for how to move forward. Thank you. Yeah, I think data cleaning, cleaning, that cleaning process is such a pain point. It is a common pain point. There are many people in that boat um, and kind of that sphere of like, how do we navigate through this pain point? How do we identify the ways to keep continuously cleaning our data is a big aspect of it. You can kind of look at it from one space, like there's just the matrix and what's spots that need to be cleaned from there. But it's that linking that Dan talked about that really brought up that process where it was linking across different data, different spreadsheets that they had with the matrix, the housing scores, and then the goals that really brought out quite a bit that was able to really create some really amazing recommendations to help strengthen their process. So hope, Amanda, that helped answer your question on the data cleaning process. Um, and Mary Jane asked a question about how was the matrix developed? Was that with Kinder? Or did Android already have that? I would love for Corinne, thank you, Lee, for kind of talking a little about that in the chat, but I would love for Corinne to expand on that. Because I think when United Way and Kinder, we embarked on this case study concept, it was kind of who already had some data practices going on that were pretty strong and pretty robust. And Angel Reach came to mind because of what they were doing with the matrix and kind of how they were um, looking at their clients and their data practices. But I would love for Karen, if you could talk more about how y'all picked that matrix. Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> we um, visited a couple organizations that had matrixes um, outside the Houston area, to be very honest with you. And um, we were just looking at ways to track client success you know, um, client profiles and client success and, and a couple names came up for recommendations. So we looked at their stuff and then we, the youth coaches honestly um, developed the matrix and then it went out for review to the different departments, you know, like the employment, the education and everything. And we came together and wrote it ourselves, to be honest with you. And then after it was in process for a couple of years and we revised it, and now we are revising it again because of some of the Kinder Institute recommendations. Um, uh, they brought out some uh, ambiguous parts into it that we didn't know were there. <laughs> As it's based on human um, interpretation and working with it every day. Um, I did see a question that had popped up asking about the pre and the post. There was something about a question of pre and the post. Um, and also the how we take it. The matrix is now in Casebook, and so it's done electronically on the form and calculated in Casebook. Before that, it was the old Google form, and we filled it out either in print or online as we were talking to the clients. Uh, again, you're dealing with nonprofit and our budgets. Um, and we do an exit as a group for every client. So an exit matrix is taken too when somebody leaves the program. Uh, uh, we do that evaluation too. But I think that answers the question. Uh, yeah. No, not really. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, you're on. what question you got? I, 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 I got that. I, and I, in a, but in reality, you may have 50 people who started and, and only 25 people that exit out and you can get in contact with for them to do an actual post uh, survey on them. So how, how do you do that when you start with 50 uh, pre-test, but now you only have 25 because you can't reach the people or uh, they don't want to answer the questions anymore or uh, those, those type of things. So what do you do with those 25 
pretest that have no ending. That no ending. We we do the ending. To be very honest with you, as the group is a um, when a client comes into our program, they have a group of people that are walking with them for their success. You know, you have a, an education and employment, a counselor with, for the mental health and the substance abuse. And so if a client leaves the program in not the most opportune way, um, the group will sit down and do the matrix, knowing where they were at at that point, again, as they were leaving in, in different circumstances. And we complete it that way if we don't do it actually with a client. So we still have some information. And again, it's always based on the relationships we have with them. Got a thumbs up from Amanda on that one. Thank you. Uh, I'd be curious to hear from others if they want to put in the chat, how do they handle the missing post survey? If someone exits their program before that anticipated time, how do you capture that information? I know there's others who maybe um, capture that or do that differently. So if you want to, if, Feel free to chime that into the chat if you have more to add there. Um, the other question came up of how much does it cost to go through the data evaluation process? I realize this was free for Angel Reach, but in the world, real world, what's an estimate of cost? Um, it really varies based on what you're looking to do, whether it's a program, whether it's a whole agency, whether it's just one matrix, it really does vary. Um, I don't think there's a, a flat rate or flat fee. I think it, it it kind of varies. I don't know if Corinne, if you've had experience with any external evaluators or if you know if anybody from Kinder has thoughts on that one. Yeah, we don't have any. I, I don't have any idea on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, evaluation work can obviously be quite expensive. I think really at the end of the day, as an organization, the key thing, and I think this is what um, again, was was central to some of uh, the ability for us to continue to move through this project was knowing what we are trying to get at the end of the day. What is the information you are after that um, you can be collecting all the data in the world, but if you sit down and start reflecting on uh, what your measure of success should look like or what you think of success as being, if that's not captured in your data, um, there is no amount of money you can spend on an evaluation to understand whether or not your program is successful or not. And so there are some really early first steps that can be done as an organization, knowing the knowing you know the population you're serving, knowing the types of outputs and outcomes you're trying to create, uh, what does success look like in that regards, and am I collecting the information to know it? And if the answer to that question is yes, and now let's move on, again, that's where the price tags can start varying all over the place. But I would say just, you know, uh, um, I think what was really, really helpful here was being able to come back to that question of what are we trying to learn? What is the information we're after? And ultimately, what does success look like? In this case, working uh, in collaboration with Angel Reach, but for anyone, again, what does success look like? And is that what we have data to be able to answer? Thank you, Dan. Thanks for that part. Uh, I think we've gotten through all the questions that are already in the chat. I want to give folks more time to put questions in the chat if you have anything else that's kind of really on top of mind. Or if you're, you know, it's great to see some folks are like really excited about some of the learnings and bringing this back. Um, and Amanda, your hand's up. Thank you. I have a ton of questions, but I, and it, <laughs> for time's sake, I'll just narrow it down. Uh, so Kinder, anybody from Kinder, is there... Could there possibly be a um, uh, assessment 101 class for nonprofits that you could give us a very high level of walking through your processes so that, I mean, obviously, you know, we can't afford, all of us can't afford to have your services, but just some of some basic stuff that will give us uh, an opportunity to, to generate those results or to interpret our data a little bit better than maybe some, let me respond. Better than I'm doing. Let me put it that way. <laughs> uh, J Jessica, this feels like uh, I know the question was asked of Kinder, but I, I don't want to steal thunder. So, um, Jessica, what, what do you got about that? Yeah, that's an exciting question, Amanda. That is kind of what we're about to embark on with coffee and quality and expanding some of our efforts. And so the case study is one element of that um, deeper engagement that we'll have deeper opportunities and so I love that suggestion I think that's something we will totally fold into the 
the expansion of coffee and quality coming up. That's a few slides away. I was going to kind of tease that out at the end since it's kind of now more official and we're really excited for what lays ahead. But this is definitely something that will just be um, growing in the year to come. Thank you. Oh, Amanda, thank you for the claps and the, the thumbs up. Um, a few other questions in the chat, but yes, the presentation will be shared. We have it recorded. We'll also be doing a, a write-up of this whole experience for the case study. So, you know, you'll definitely have that to live on. Um, so some really great information coming in the chat. While y'all think of other questions or anything coming up, I do want to just have a moment to reflect with Kinder and with Angel Reach and with United Way about what was our biggest takeaway from your involvement with this case study. And so maybe we'll we'll start with Elias, then we'll go to Corinne, then we'll we'll give Kinder the, the last word on that one. First, I guess like during my time from having a more hands-off approach and just being part of the conversation and you know providing insight where where I could I felt my biggest insight was just document and simple was documentation. A lot of the time, especially in the nonprofit world, turnover is so high. And in the case of Korean, where you have a coach who has all this information, knows the kids' history, you know, backwards, upside down, left to right. When that person is gone, all that knowledge disappears with them. And if that information isn't documented anywhere, all that work that has been done to help that kid go from where they were to where they are is lost and you have to start all over again. So for me, we have all these tools and the tools are only as good as the people who use them. So if they're not being used to their maximum ability, information isn't being documented, we can have the best tools in the world, but they aren't going to do anything because the information is nowhere to be found. And then you have to start all over with that person. And that is just another barrier that that person has to overcome to tell their story again. And it can be discouraging at times. So for me, it was just you no know, simply. You know, whenever something happens, it's documented to make sure that there's a history of what's happening. So when someone else comes, they know exactly where to pick up for that person. Thanks, Elias. Corinne? Okay, we have two takeaways. Um, the first one is after having someone outside the organization look at measuring, uh, the proposed solution was so simple, but so missed. Uh, you using the completion rate of actual driven goals to determine success proved to be the magic measuring point that we were looking for and just required the prompting from a different perspective to see it that way. You know, when you're in the weeds, uh, having an outside source uh, was invaluable. And then also having someone outside the organization looking at the data, it was humbling. <laughs> and you try not to take it very personal, <laughs> but it was worth it. When you're in the day to day to day, you don't necessarily see the inconsistencies as you get everything to match in the end. That we were in a transition to automation of case files showed some areas from improvement, uh, which we were able then to implement easily into our new system. And we greatly appreciate Kinder for assisting us that in that transition and giving recommendations on the automation points. Thank you, Corinne. Yeah, so uh, I, I think from the Kinder perspective, our takeaway kind of goes back to where we started with Catherine's statement around the partnership model and that um, this was one of our first efforts at bringing this type of research practice partnership uh, approach that Kinder has been doing for over a decade with, edu uh, with education partners, particularly school districts around the Houston area. Um, we've not necessarily tried it in other sectors and, and with nonprofits, for example. And so um, this was uh, a, a sort of uncharted territory and there's always a question mark of will some of the principles and practices translate or where will there need to be a whole new body of discovery? And, and so um, for us, I think the takeaway was that uh, there's sort of an affirmation, yes, uh, partnership principles and practices can work in these other settings. And I think, um, you know, again, going back to, um, coming in with an understanding that that involves a particular mindset, a particular spirit, a particular approach. Um, you know, as, as much as Corinne talks about sort of that, you know, it, it's really 
I understand the vulnerability that Angel Reach put placed themselves in, uh, the vulnerable position that they placed themselves in by sharing data out to an unknown. And, and that's who we were at the start of this process. And, and so um, trust being a critical central piece of, of partnership research and, and the collaboration space. And so um, just, uh, uh, there are other very cool aspects of the study that we could we could probably as researchers geek out on a little bit, but I, I think like if if we if I reflect on what allowed for this to succeed, what got us here today, my takeaway was was this this um, uh, opportunity to see what partnership and partnering and collaborating looks like in spaces such as working with nonprofits. So very appreciative of the opportunity and excited to think about what's next. Thank you. Thank you all um, for those for sharing those takeaways. I hope everyone here has some some takeaways that they can bring back into the fold of their work and what they're doing. You know, a lot of the recommendations that came from this kind of exploration of the data and answering questions with the data that Angel Reach had is oftentimes have people ask, like, how do we measure success? What does success look like for our program, for who we're serving? And so kind of taking that step back and looking at your data and re-examining. I love Corinne was like, it was just so simple. And sometimes it is that. So having that as a as an open mind and open heart to that really speaks to, you know, looking at your data and trying to make headway of it all. The other side of it is that automation piece. So many data systems, so many different apps or have this automation. And how do you lean into that to work smarter and not harder? Um, so really exploring that for what tools and resources you have um, at your disposal and how can you how can you leverage that? Um, that's something definitely to, to continue to explore. Uh, so with that, I will say again, many thanks to Corinne and Jean from Angel Reach for just being amazing partners in this. Um, they had such an open mind the whole time. We had our first kickoff meeting in June and we literally like wrapped up to walk through this coffee and quality presentation on Tuesday. So it was about five months that this whole case study experience happened. Um, from, you know, uploading, sharing data into analyzing data, into sharing results, talking, conversations. I think a total was eight meetings I was tracking. Uh, and so that's what that's what it looked like. And it was really great to just have Corinne and Jean just lean into that. And then also amazing partners at Kinder Institute with, with Dan, Catherine, Lee, just diving in and not knowing what was going to happen with the data, but just, you know, really being there and being in this space of learning together. Um, it was true continuous quality improvement in like an amazing form. Uh, so, so thank you all. And with that, we are really excited about what's ahead for coffee and quality in 2024 and beyond. We're expanding coffee and quality. Many of you know, we meet here quarterly. Um, we also have a learning cohort that deep dives into storytelling with data through data, data visualization. That will continue on. That will expand a little bit in its own right to where they'll be doing more technical skill building called learning circles around specific um, data visualization tools. We'll have this ongoing case study opportunity twice a year. Um, and then we will also have a fellows program. And so the fellows program is where we'll work with a cohort of organizations to really develop and strengthen their data and evaluation practices to support sustainability. We are really excited about that one. That's the, the big next evolution of coffee and quality and really helping support nonprofits develop data and evaluation practices. So, so stay tuned. Um, Please give us your feedback. As always, please sign up for 2024 Coffee and Quality. Um, we really appreciate the time you spend here, the time you spend doing your work, as well as you know, lifting up the data elements that you have. And so thank you again. Thank you for your time here today. We're giving quite a bit of time back now. So with that, take the time to do the survey, share your feedback. We use your feedback to inform what's ahead and sign up for the 2024 sessions. Um, so, so thank you all so much and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you.